Newhauser, who's an investigator here at uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, will uh, kick this off. So let's see if this is. Thank you, Seth. Good morning, everyone. the highlights from the past year, and there have actually been two major reports on lifestyle factors and prostate cancer risk. The first one is something that you may have heard about in the news over the past month. It was a scientific report of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, and there's a, a website link which you can um, look at if you're interested. This was just released in February, just uh, not quite two months ago, and I had the privilege to be on this uh, committee. And for the very first time, the report included substantial diet-related cancer prevention evidence, including for prostate cancer. Um, every five years, the United States renews our dietary guidelines, which essentially acts as the nutrition policy piece or gets turned into the nutrition policy piece for the United States, and it's always been cardiovascular driven. And so that's why you've probably heard some of the recommendations, for instance, about dietary fat intake or sodium and so forth, because it's always been cardiovascular disease driven. This time, for the very first time, they recruited uh, two people with cancer expertise to be on the committee, myself, and another quite well-known uh, prostate cancer researcher, Dr. Steve Clinton from The Ohio State University. So we were very pleased that we were able to thoroughly review the evidence as it relates to cancer prevention, including prostate cancer prevention. And in a few moments, I'll tell you about some of the highlights from the report. The other major report that came out in the fall was the World Cancer Research Fund's report on diet physical activity and prostate cancer. And the World Cancer Research Fund is a, um, it's a UK organization and it partners with a group in the United States called the American Institute for Cancer Research. And they now um, have committees that review all the scientific evidence for specific cancers. And I was not on this committee, but Dr. Clinton was on this prostate committee for um, WCRF. And they came up with very similar recommendations as we did uh, in the United States. So for the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, a major focus was to examine dietary patterns instead of isolated nutrients. A few times when I've come here in the past to speak with you on, on these yearly um, symposiums, I might have talked to you about some specific isolated nutrients, including vitamin D, um, calories, dietary fat, and so forth. What we really wanted to emphasize this time in the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee was the entire dietary pattern, with the thought that the whole is more than the sum of its parts, because that's what the evidence is starting to tell us. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. So what are dietary patterns? We define dietary patterns as the quantities, proportions, variety or combination of different foods, drinks, nutrients when those data are available in diets, and the frequency with which they are habitually consumed. So why study dietary patterns instead of these isolated nutrients? Well, first of all, diet's very complex. People eat foods and meals, not nutrients, so there's a better sense that we can perhaps translate our scientific information to patients and the public in a more coherent manner if we talk about dietary patterns rather than these isolated nutrients. Secondly, there's a lot of correlation among dietary constituents, meaning that if someone eats, um, say, a lot of dietary fat, often that particular nutrient commingles with refined grains and added sugars and things like that. So these things are not in isolation. Foods are always a combination of a lot of different nutrients. And the analysis from a statistical standpoint of single nutrients may be confounded by the effect of the dietary pattern. 
Another important point with regard to studying dietary patterns is that a lot of clinical trials, which are studies where we might randomize people to one diet or another, they have shown very positive health outcomes for changes in total diet, where we, in other words, where we advise someone to follow, say, the DASH diet, which you might have heard of. That's called the Dietary Approaches to Soft Hypertension. That was kind of a comprehensive overall dietary intervention that emphasized fruits and vegetables, low sodium, low fat dairy, and so forth. And this is one of the most exciting dietary interventions that's ever happened because this is an excellent example of how research gets translated into patient care. So the DASH diet um, first came out, the trial was first published you know, more than um, 15 years ago. And now when people go to their physician and they might have a little bit of elevated blood pressure or some other risk factors, they're told to follow the DASH diet. So it's really become part of clinical practice. So this is the direction that we would like to go with prostate cancer prevention as well, this kind of thing. Another study called the Lyon Diet Heart Study had a similar type of approach, and there were very effective results from these whole diet packages as opposed to single nutrients. So how do we evaluate dietary patterns? In the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years, we use several different approaches that you can see here. Oh, it looks like this is not working. So the DASH eating pattern is one that I mentioned that emphasizes fruits and vegetables, low-fat dairy, whole grains, minimal, minimal amounts of um, highly processed foods, including refined grains. And when we do research studies and ask people to report on their diet, we can break down the foods and see how well, just on a free living basis, they already adhere to this DASH eating pattern. We have something called the Healthy Eating Index, which is a way to score someone's diet 100 points. Great, thank you. The Healthy Eating Index is designed to be more or less of a score that tells, tells us how well someone adheres to uh, the dietary guidelines for Americans. And on average, the average American has a score of about uh, 55 to 60 where 100 points is a perfect diet and zero points is a pretty lousy diet. So we do have some room to grow, but the healthy eating index is, is one of these scoring systems that more or less scores the whole diet. And then we have uh, the Mediterranean diet and then an alternate version of the Mediterranean diet. And the Mediterranean diet is another sort of scoring system because it's been observed that People who live in the Mediterranean region have lower rates of cardiovascular disease, and there's probably a variety of reasons for that, including genetics, physical activity, and diet is probably one uh, reason. And the Mediterranean diet is rich in fish, uh, low-fat dairy, whole grains, and so forth. So what we found um, in doing the uh, evidence review for the Dietary Guidelines uh, Advisory Committee, that the common characteristics of dietary patterns that were associated with positive health outcomes included a higher intake of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, low-fat dairy, fish and seafood, legumes, lean meat, and nuts, and moderate intake of alcohol. People always ask, well, what is moderate? Uh, for men, it's no more than two drinks a day. Less is better. Uh, for women, it's no more than one drink a day. Also, lower consumption of red and processed meat and low intake of sugar-sweetened foods and beverages and refined grains. So some specifics. You might be asking, well, what is processed meat? I hear that term all the time. What does that mean? Well, processed meat is things like bacon, hot dogs, sausage, cold cuts. It's meats that have been cured. And we don't really want to get into the weeds of what it is about these processed meats that might be harmful. It could be um, the nitrates that are used to cure the meat. It could be the high sodium. It could be it's high in fat or it's cooked at a high temperature or all of those. But what we know is as a whole, consuming a lot of processed meat can be harmful. 
How do you know if a grain is a whole grain? Well, you need to look at the labels. Look for something that says 100% whole wheat, barley with the hull. So pearled barley has the hull taken off. It's not a whole grain. So the barley has to have the hull on it. Brown rice, steel oats, bulgur wheat, wheat berries, anything that has that outer um, endosperm on it um, is considered a whole grain. How about added sugars? How do you know if something has added sugars? Well, added sugars likes to get um, disguised as many different names. I'm sure you've heard of corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup, but now a lot of company, companies are using ev evaporated cane, cane juice, even brown rice syrup. So you think, oh, this is healthy. It has brown rice. No, the brown rice has been boiled and boiled and boiled and just distilled down until it's nothing but a syrupy mess and that's used as the sweetener. So that's considered an added sugar. Even fruit syrups, and I don't mean 100% fruit juice that you can drink and is perfectly healthy, but when they boil it down and boil it down and boil it down until there's nothing left but a syrup, that's considered an added sugar. Uh, cane sugar, beet sugar, the list goes you know, on and on and on. So label reading can be quite important. So for dietary patterns and prostate cancer, what we found on the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee is that these findings do apply to prostate cancer prevention, but there were far fewer papers. There were, you know, um, many, many published findings on colorectal cancer and breast cancer. So we really need more research in this area to support strong recommendations for prostate cancer prevention. But in the meantime, we do believe that these recommendations will be effective. So I mentioned the World Cancer Research Fund Prostate Cancer Report. This project is very similar in nature to the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee in that there is systematic review of the published literature on diet, physical activity, and prostate cancer risk, and experts around the globe comprise the committee. And one of the major conclusions was related to the relationship of body weight and adiposity and prostate cancer risk. And what they found was they examined all these studies that had been published on body mass index or adiposity and prostate cancer risk. And if you look at this diamond down here at the bottom, this is called the overall summary of all the data. And so for every... Um, five kilogram per meter square increase in BMI. So basically that means when you're moving from normal weight to overweight or overweight to obese, you have an 8% eight, eight increased risk of prostate cancer. So confirms uh, previous findings that body weight is related to risk. They were also able to examine waist circumference and there were fewer studies available but most of them were consistent and showed an increased risk. So if you have a higher um, waist circumference or more abdominal girth, that probably increases your risk more than body weight alone. So here's the increased risk for the waist circumference. So some summary and major take home points. Remember that the whole is more than the sum of its parts as far as dietary intake goes. And this is really important because you can have Brussels sprouts for dinner and think, oh great, I'm getting my vegetables. But if you had Cheetos and a Coke for lunch and that was all you had for lunch, you have to think about the whole dietary pattern. I can't really say that it would necessarily be negated, but what you eat for lunch is just as important as what you have for dinner. So continue to have your vegetables, but think about the whole dietary pattern, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. A dietary pattern that's rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy, lean meats, non-meat proteins, including legumes and nuts. Legumes are some of the best foods we have. They're just fantastic. And, and foods that have minimal added sugars and refined grains is a healthy pattern. So think about the whole pattern, what you're eating on a day-in and day-out basis, and don't get hung up too much in isolated nutrients. There is no single food, nutrient, or dietary supplement pill or any ingredient that will uniformly and consistently reduce risk. The whole dietary pattern is important. There's nothing magic. 
about a particular supplement or about a particular food ingredient. You might have seen some talk on um, TV or read in magazines about so-called superfoods. Superfoods are okay because they're another way to think about a nutrient-dense food where we get a lot of nutrients in one food, but they're not magic. You know, don't, don't think of foods as having a magical attribute. It's the whole dietary pattern that will keep you healthy. So also maintain a healthy weight. And you may get tired of me saying this. I said the same thing last year, but it's really important. So maintain a healthy weight. Exercise at least 30 minutes a day. It can be walking or anything else that you enjoy. Do it rain or shine. Do it every day, 30 minutes. More if you can do it or if you have time, but at least 30 minutes every single day. Find a walking or exercise partner, especially if it's raining. You want to take a walk? Make that date with that person. Say, we're going to go, rain or shine. You know, we're going to do it every day. So that's it, and now I'll turn it over to uh, John.